Gabriel? Yes, yes, I'll, I'll share. Um, Perfect. Moment. Can you see and hear well? Yes, we can see everything. So I think we can uh, start. So you know it's 30 plus 10, okay. ideally. But of course, if there are questions in between, it's not so strict, but 40 minutes in total. And again, if there are questions during the talk, and if they are quick, uh, you can go ahead, or we uh, wait uh, to the end. Okay. Okay, so next speaker is Gabriel Nagaoka, and he's going to tell us about supersymmetric Wilson loops and deformations. So please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the organizers for the, the chance of speaking here in, in this conference a bit about my work which is on uh, supersymmetric Wilson loops and the formation of them. Uh, my goals in this talk would be to just uh, have an introduction uh, to supersymmetric Wilson loops in the ADS-CFT, as well as uh, the construction of these Wilson loops in ABGM theories, which are uh, relevant to the ADS-CFT correspondence as well, and also uh, introduce the formation of these supersymmetric Wilson loops. Okay, so in order, in order to do that, we have an overview, which is uh, just a quick introduction. Then uh, I'll jump to the definition of a supersymmetric Wilson loop, and uh, this will uh, shed some light on how to construct them. And also, uh, we will make touch with the, these deformations of these connections of these Wilson loops and the contour deformations. This will uh, become clearer as we go. Okay, so we start with the most basic question that uh, we may ask, which is uh, why do we care about Wilson loops? And mainly because they are connected to many uh, interesting physical features of gauge theories. So the first, the first contact that we have with Wilson loops are the of bohm effect in quantum mechanics, where we can uh, follow a particle under a, a gauge field and uh, and just take the, the holonomy and, and see that, that it, it reflects as a phase on the state of this particle. And uh, furthermore, uh, Wilson loops are also interesting in the ideas of trying to define confinement in lattice, in lattice gauge theories um, because they are non-local operators and they are sensible to the IR physics of these, of these theories. And uh, also they have a more mathematical uh, aspect of them, which is, uh, uh, highly explored by Wheaton uh, and relates uh, the evaluation of, of Wilson loops in chern simons theory with not invariance. And this is a, a very uh, nice work where he uh, is able to give a precise definition of these, of these Jones polynomials in terms of uh, three-dimensional uh, field theory. Also, they are uh, interesting in the sense of the CFT bootstrap where people have been considering polygon Wilson loops and taking different uh, smart limits in order to extract, uh, to extract uh, exact uh, correlation functions in these theories. Um, and of particular interest to Wilson loops is also uh, when we have the alliance between Wilson loops and, and supersymmetry where we can uh, use techniques of localization uh, in order to, to extract exact results. So uh, it can happen sometimes uh, that uh, when our Wilson loop is supersymmetric, uh, we can uh, just uh, evaluate the vacuum expectation value of this operator exactly. And this is quite nice because uh, it relates to the, to the uh, other physical observables of, this, of the theory, such as the Bremsstrahlung radiation, which is the radiation of a charged particle uh, in this theory. Um, this is all uh, gauge side, but uh, Wilson loops are also interested, interesting in the ADS-CFT correspondence sense, because uh, these exact results can carry over to string theory because there is a nice description of Wilson loops in terms of propagating strings in ADS. And this picture is uh, held together by the existence of supersymmetry. So uh, let's just take a look very quickly at uh, what it means holographically to have a Wilson loop. So uh, in this picture, we have this plane where I write CFT, which is uh, where your gauge theory lives. And then you have a bulk 
which is an AVS of dimension and cross some compact manifold. So given a contour, oops, sorry, given a contour of your Wilson loop, uh, the prescription to calculate the vacuum expectation value of these operators is by, it's by means of a, of a minimal surface, which can be seen as a string propagating in ADS, such that the boundary conditions of the string end on this loop. Okay? And uh, uh, this is a very nice picture, and this uh, compact manifold has, uh, has uh, an important an important physical property, which is that the, it is related to the R symmetry of the Wilson loop. So as the Wilson loop, as, as the string propagates in this space, it can also propagate, in, propagate inside this compact manifold. And we can uh, see that uh, by exploring R symmetry constraints in the Wilson loop, we can also explore uh, isometries of these solutions. Uh, and for instance, uh, CFT could be an N equals four in uh, supreme wheels. In this case, the bulk interior would be just a, a DS, ADS5 cross S5. But for a particular interest to us would be when the CFT is the ABJM theory, which is a three-dimensional theory, and the bulk interior is ADS4 cross CP3. Okay, so let's uh, just take a look what is the definition of a supersymmetric Wilson loop. So you can start with your favorite supersymmetric theory. Uh, which uh, can, uh, for instance, have an action functional, which depends on a gauge field and certain matter fields that I call capital Phi. Okay, so this theory is invariant under supersymmetric variation, where you have uh, some supercharges and some Grassmann perimeters. Okay, so a Wilson loop is an operator that depends on a space-time contour, it depends on your gauge field, and it can depend on matter fields as well. And it's defined as a trace of a path order exponential of a loop connection around this path. Okay, so uh, if you join these two notions, you have the notion of a supersymmetric Wilson loop, which is a Wilson loop which is annihilated by a supersymmetric transformation for some choice of your supercharges. Okay, it doesn't need to be annihilated by, by all of them. And uh, this, in general, constrains the, how the Wilson loop couples to these fields, and it also constrains the contour of these fields. And uh, it is usual to categorize the Wilson loops in respect to the, amount, to the amount of supersymmetry that they preserve. So half BPS solutions would preserve half of the total supercharges, one fourth, one fourth of the total supercharges and so, and so on. Okay, so now that we have a definition of the Wilson loop, uh, how do we construct this Wilson loops? We can uh, take a look at uh, uh, more familiar example uh, before ABGM, which is n equals four super wheels. So you take a look at the fields that make up your theory. So you have one gauge field, you have six scalars and four fermions. All of these fields are in the adjoint of an SUN. Okay, so you know, for, for instance, how a supersymmetric variation acts on these fields. So for instance, it transforms the gauge field into fermions. It also transforms uh, uh, scalars into fermions and transforms uh, 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 fermions in a, in a similar fashion. So uh, in order to construct a supersymmetric Wilson loop, you specify the contour, which is C. And then you can see that uh, when you take a look at the variation of the gauge field, it gives a fermion. And the variation of a scalar also gives a fermion. So uh, you propose an ansatz, which can have some hope of canceling when the variation is taken. And indeed, uh, the maximal supersymmetric Wilson loop in N equals four, uh, which satisfies the constraint of being an annihilated by half of the supercharges can be found this way. And uh, it, when you take the variation of this connection, it uh, constrains the, 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 the contour to be a straight line on a circle. And it also constrains this coupling to the scalar to be a unit vector. So uh, we're mostly interested in constructing these this operators in the ABGM theory, which is a slightly more complicated theory. It has a six-fold supersymmetry. And uh, we, we ask ourselves if we, can, if we can repeat this procedure. So it has two gauge fields to start with instead of one. Uh, each one is in the adjoint of uh, UN group. It has uh, four complex fermions and four uh, complex, sorry, it has four, four complex scalars and four fermions. And 
instead of being in the adjoint of these gauge groups, these uh, matter fields transform in the bifundamental representation. So it is important to consider uh, the quiver structure of ABGN. And this tells you, uh, this is just a, book, uh, key, a bookkeeping device that tells you how different fields transform under gauge transformations. So uh, we have uh, U1 being the, on the adjoint. Whenever an arrow gets out of the node, it picks up a, a U dagger factor. And when it, when it goes in, it, it picks a U factor. So this is a joint. Then scalars and, and fermions are in the bifundamental because they transform uh, according to UN as well as, U, as UM. And you have the other, quiver, the other gauge group, and you can follow the quiver. Apart from the structure of gauge transformations, we have also to consider uh, the supersymmetry of this theory. And uh, it possesses SU4 R symmetry, uh, which means that we have, we have uh, these supercharges and as being anti-symmetric tensors of rank two of SU4. So these indices I and J, they go from one to four. And by specifying these different uh, Grassmann parameters, we specify a general transformation of supersymmetry in this theory. And we have two, 12 point ahead supercharges and 12, uh, and 12 uh, superconformal charges. Okay. So um, can we repeat the procedure to find uh, supersymmetric Wilson loops in ABGN? Uh, if we, re we recall, the procedure was to just look at the, the gauge multiplet, meaning we couple uh, our our loop to a gauge field and, and bosonic matter, okay? And uh, we have to consider CC bar because uh, CC bar transforms in the adjoint and also it has the correct, di the correct dimensions. So M is part of our ansatz. It tells us how to couple to these to this scalars. And uh, when we take the variation of this supersymmetric Wilson loop and impose it to be zero, as it was first done by Drucker, Young, and Plefka, uh, you can see that this is a 1,6 PKS solution that uh, is parameterized by the supercharges theta 1, 2 and theta 3, 4. And uh, when you solve for, this, for these equations, you have that the matrix is diagonal minus 1, minus 1, 1 and 1, which means that the R symmetry is SU2 times SU2 for this, for this loop. And the contours is straight line or circle. Okay, this, is, this was kind of a bummer because at the time uh, it, was, it was known that it, there existed a dual uh, solution which was half BPS. And in order to find the half BPS solution in the gauge theory side, you must also couple to fermions in, and N scalars. So the, the correct prescription is actually to, um, to enhance the connection to a super connection which couples to both gauge fields as well as fermions. And this node, uh, this is the, the UN node, this is the UM node, and these guys transform, transform in the bifundamental. Uh, uh, Danny, I have a question? Oh, sure. Yeah, if I remember well, actually, apart from adding a fermion, uh, you have to change the matrix a little bit. M yeah, shouldn't yes. be my... Yes, that is true. Uh, I will show it. I will show it now. Actually. Okay. So the second second question I have because this Wilson loop, the one half BPS Wilson loop, was a kind of passing because I mean there is no bad reason. I mean there is no reason for not uh, accepting these fermions, but it was a novelty. So, but as far as I know, I, the, the, my question is about the state of the art. Nobody has proven that there is no one BPS Wilson loop with no fermions. So the only thing is that the people only know that one, right? That's correct or not? Uh, I believe so. Uh, I have never seen any any constructions of, of uh, uh, Wilson loops that have more than half BPS uh, operators. Uh, sorry, uh, of one six. No, no, one half BPS actually. One half yeah, BPS no, is more. maximum supersymmetry. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean that it probably there is another one half BPS solution. We know fermions or that. No, nobody. Uh, I, I don't nobody think has so. Been. Because I know that no, it's not known. I know that it's not known, but my question is whether it has been proven that it is, doesn't. I, I, I believe it's not, it's not proven, but you can see that uh, in order to respect uh, 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 being able to make a well-defined gauge transformation in these connections, and as well as having a 
a dimensional connection because it's part of a, a argument of exponent. There is not much that you can put plug in here to start toying with things. So the only thing you can do is just changing M with some sign there and I in the fermion. Okay. I believe so, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so, uh, so now we just couple to the fermions and see what happens. So it's the same thing, basically. You still have a, a matrix, which is an ansatz of your problem. This matrix is encoded in here, A1 and A2. And uh, now you have these, these uh, couplings to the fermions, which tell you what uh, is the intensity of the, the coupling to the Wilson loop, depending on the contour that you choose that is parameterized by tau. And uh, now it's a novelty because if you just look for solutions uh, of supersymmetry that annihilate this connection, you will find that they are trivial on the fermionic couplings because delta just acts on, the, on each component uh, independently. And then it, in order for, it, for the off diagonal to be zero, eta and eta bar has to be zero, and you are back to the one six BPS case. So uh, it's too strong to construct. Sorry, sorry for yes. bothering you. Just an additional question. Uh, even though you are working on this SUN slash M, still the trace you use is not the supergroup trace, it's the, it's the standard trace. It is the supergroup is trace. Ah, okay, it's the, it's the supergroup trace. Yes, but there is, a, there is a caveat that you have to twist, uh, you have to have some twist matrix in order to do that. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a detail that we can uh, talk about later if you want. But it's invariant under the full supergroup uh, gauge transformation or not? Yes, it's a super trace. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so this is, a too, too, this is too strong a constraint. And then uh, th there, this is what uh, Gaston was, was talking about. Uh, the solution to, to understand uh, what is happening here is that you exchange a supersymmetric transformation uh, for- Sorry, Gabriel, there's a question yes. by Andres. I don't know, Andres, if you really want to make the question now, maybe it's good. Well, it's, I, I just wonder whether supersymmetry somehow constrained, whether the loop is space-like or time-like or null. Uh, up to this point, it is a completely arbitrary uh, contour. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, so yeah, the, the contour is also part of the ansatz. So you don't know what contour you're talking about until the last step. Okay, so the idea, this is uh, Cardinali, Martelloni, uh, Seminara, I believe. Uh, they, they realized that uh, actually what you need to do is to abuse this un slash m embedding of the connection and exchange a supersymmetry variation by a total derivative of an element of this group, which is g. And this is much more complicated than uh, the previous like n equals four constructions where you had just the trivial constraint. And uh, in 2009, actually there was already the solution to this problem. Uh, it was due to Drucker and Trancanelli, where they found out uh, the, the matrix M, which is uh, now minus one, 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 and one, which means that uh, this heavy PS solution is actually a U1 times an SU3 instead of SU2 times SU2 as the bosonic one, and also explicit uh, fermionic couplings, which will not, will not be so interesting to us. Okay, so this brings us to uh, uh, my, my work with uh, Post, Tense, and Pepinier which is uh, that uh, the half BPS and then, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, and the contour is a, a circle or a straight line. Okay. Uh, uh, the idea is that the half BPS and the one six BPS loop are homologically equivalent. Uh, this has also, uh, all sorts of, of, uh, of, of importance because uh, it means, for instance, that uh, the matrix model from localization uh, uh, collapses to the same, the same matrix model, so they have the same uh, expectation value. And uh, since they are in the same cohomology, we uh, try to propose uh, a space of 1.6 BPS loops in such a way that we have an extra parameter uh, which parameterizes the family of this 1.6 BPS space and enhances to the half BPS case for some limit of these parameters. So we start with a bosonic connection 
and deform it with some, uh, so this is the deformation of the connection of the bosonic one, and it try to generalize the one six bosonic connection to a one six fermionic connection, which is uh, also one six BPS. So in order to do that, we constructed this deformation. So you can just take a look and you say, okay, you're a maniac, why would you consider something like this? And uh, basically uh, it was trial and error, but we can understand some features of this deformation, which I will do in the next slide. For now, uh, just notice that a G is an element of the UN slash M. So it has to be uh, bifundamental and anti-bifundamental. And uh, our, our three parameters are alpha and alpha bar, and they only couple to the scalars one and two, okay? If you do that, and you take the variation of this connection here in respect to the same uh, one six BPS uh, supercharges, you see that you indeed have a total derivative of a super, another supermatrix, which is this G here. So it is what a one six BPS family. So let's just try to understand why would someone uh, come up with an answer like this. So we're start, we are trying to get from one six BPS solution to a half BPS solution. The 1.6 BPS solution only has a gauge field, bilinears, and has no fermions. Uh, the one half BPS solution, on the other hand, it has the gauge, the bilinears of the scalars, and also has fermions. And with a particular uh, thing in mind that uh, the, the R symmetry uh, of the 1.6 bosonic is the SU2 times SU2, and the R symmetry of the half BPS fermionic is U1 times SU3. So it means that that M matrix that Gaston uh, talked about has to flip one of the signs in the diagonal. So uh, we can see that uh, we need to add fermions. So how do we add fermions? We take supersymmetric variation of this G, which was supersymmetric variation of a scalar, which will generate fermions coupled to our uh, free parameter. Uh, we, we add also a G squared. This is basically G squared which is uh, the square of an off-diagonal matrix, which, which will also generate bilinears of the scalars, now coupled to the, to the free parameters alpha that we, we put here, and also in the, in the lower, di lower diagonal. So as these guys only couple to one and two, we can uh, start to, take, to understand that these alphas may have the property of twisting the signs that appear in the M, which is the L that I did not hit, uh, did, did not write here, but it is the M that has SU2 times SU2. So this is a 1.6 BPS family. How do we see the enhancement for the one half BPS? The idea is exactly to twist the SU2, SU2 into a U1 times SU3. And uh, if you evaluate the full connection, which is the bosonic connection 1.6 plus the deformation, you will have this connection that is written here. So this guy comes from the prelude bosonic, which is the M, which is minus one, minus one, one and one. And this guy here, this delta M, comes exactly from the deformation, which couples to the bilinears of the scalars. And, and do not pay attention for now for these uh, factors of one fourth. Uh, this can be reabsorbed by a gauge transformation. So basically now we have generated some some mechanism that has uh, the correct, the correct uh, coupling to the bilinears. And we have free parameters in a way that we can twist the SU2, SU2 into U1 times SU3. And in fact, this is uh, how we understand the, the enhancement of, of BPS. -ness. Also, uh, this, is, this is nice because uh, uh, it, it has a, a, a free parameter and you can understand enhancements when we did not have this before uh, this construction. So uh, now I would like to switch gears a bit and instead of talking about deformations on the connection space, I would like to talk about deformations on the contour space. And I would like to do that because deformations on the contour are related to the Bremsstrahlung function which is uh, the function that carries the information of the energy radiated by a particle which is colored under the gauge group of this, of this theory. And uh, this uh, construction is due to Mauro Senna, Correa, and Hen. 
where they take the line of the BPI of uh, head BPS loop in, in ABGM, and they uh, this can be understood as a as a particle traveling through space time, and then you kick it, and it goes off uh, from uh, an angle phi with its in initial direction, and uh, is just a a vector that is actually that, that theta i from the first slide. So it's, it says to you in which direction you are choosing your, your scalar to couple the Wilson loop. So when you, when you uh, calculate the expectation value of this Wilson loop, it acquires a divergence, which has a, an IR parameter L and a UV cutoff epsilon. L is related to how big is this line and epsilon is related to how close to the kink do you want to integrate your modes. And this is governed by uh, this function that is called the, uh, the cusp anomalous dimension, gamma cusp. It depends only on your uh, Toft coupling of the theory and the two angles on the space time and the angle on our symmetry space. And in the small uh, angle limit, it reproduces the bram straubing function, which is this B of Lambda. Okay, this is all very nice. A, a gamma cusp is also of interest of people working in integrability. It, uh, it governs also the behavior of scattering of, of W bosons and other things. And uh, of, there is yet another way to define uh, the bram straubing function, which is equivalent to this one, but uh, less intuitive in, in the sense of, of particles traveling and being kicked which is uh, to take a Wilson loop and do a deformation, a small deformation on the contour of the loop. So suppose we have a perfect circular loop, a uh, FPPS loop, for example, and then we take the contour to be a small deformation uh, uh, psi mu. Uh, this needs to be small because we don't want any, uh, uh, we don't want any kinks appearing. And also we don't want any self intersections. So it won't generate any cusps, so no divergences, basically. Then if you take uh, the expectation value quadratically on this parameter and divide by the, the unperturbed or for the perfect circle, which in, in turn you know exactly by localization, you will recover a very nice structure, which means that uh, the bram straubing factorizes the, the, the coupling dependence from the theory. This i of psi is just a fixed, um, it's a fixed functional of the deformation. So all the, the information about lambda gets, uh, gets projected out to the Brimstrom. So this was just a point that I wanted to touch because it's very uh, interesting to play around with these Wilson loops. And it touches with the work in progress that I've been uh, developing with Tenser, Trancanelli, and Vescovi, which is to calculate the deformations of these half PPL loops in ABGM and also a perturbative check of Bram Straubing. Uh, and, it, and it goes on to higher orders in deformation. And there is the question of we can uh, recover something called the spectral independence for these loops, which is uh, a symmetry uh, related to, the, to a world sheet uh, propagating in, in ABS that uh, has some, some, some other symmetries. And also, uh, uh, it also touches with the protected operators in the line because you can understand the Wilson line as a defect and understand the, the deformations as insertions of operators in this line. Uh, so related advances, just to, to finish, uh, uh, Drucker uh, published a solo paper in, to, to, in 2020 where, where he basically did deformations on, on connection space and found out uh, modular moduli space of Wilson loops and quiver varieties, and also to appear by Drucker, Tenser, and Trincanelli, uh, and new constructions of n equal four quiver theories, and new, new Wilson loops in these theories. And with this, I just uh, want to say thank you for your attention, and I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so there is time for questions. Um, either raise your hand right in the chat or just speak up if you want to ask something. Gabriel, can I ask? Yes, you? sure. Uh, I, I don't have the possibility of raising hand here, but sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so 
is is for for the first ones on lines you were discussing uh, the the ones you you discover with your co-authors right uh, ah okay yeah okay okay we, we, we know okay. Let, let me ask the question and you will know what i'm asking okay. um is there any holographic way of computing them mm -hmm. uh Yes, there there is a way of computing them, but there is some some kind of a, a mystery. I'm not an expert on the by any means on the holographic part, but uh, so uh, the solution of the 160 PS loop was already known. So in the CFT side, and uh, the R symmetry of the loop was an SU2 times an SU2, which means that uh, which means that. Uh, Apart from, uh, not apart, <laughs> forgetting the, the words in English, uh, that in, instead of the, other, of the other construction of n equals four, where you had that the, the coupling was trivial on, on our symmetry, uh, the, in that case, it meant that the string did not propagate into this, con into this compact space. So in the case of n equals four superior mules, this is what I'm trying to say, this is ADS5 cross S5. As that theta that appears in the, in the n equals four loop is just a trivial vector. It means that it just touches the, the, a, the, the S5 in one point in all space. But now in, uh, in the case of ABJM, uh, the, the R symmetry is not, the, the, R, the isometries are not trivial. So the, the loop smears out over the CP3. So in the ABJM case, it would be ADS4 cross CP3. And as far as I know, uh, there is no explicit construction of these loops be because of this smearing. Okay, so I think people know how to do these surfaces and compute them in the case that the loop is trivial in the compact space. Okay, okay. okay. Let me ask you a second one, unless someone has another question. I don't see any hand, but okay. Um, so, uh, as you explained very well, ABJM has this, is a quiver with two nodes, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you are calculating um, exactly that. And you are calculating the Wilson line for one of those gauge groups, right? For, for both of them. For so, so when you put A, is, the, is what it's A1, A2, or the sum, what is it? Okay, so in the beginning, we could choose for the 160 PS solution, there is, uh, you always look at a joint. So we have a, a1, for example, and a CC bar, okay? And that, that closes the quiver perfectly. Okay. Perfect. So, but the half BPS, we have to uh, remember, uh, enhance that connection to a super connection, which means we are looking at all the quiver at once, which means in the first entry, we're looking at A1, C and C bar. The, the other diagonal, we're looking at A2, C bar C. Okay. And we are also considering the off diagonal, these fields that go from uh, UN to UN, which are the fermions. Okay. Does it make sense? So it couples yeah. to all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 This thing you mentioned in the end, this thing you're doing with Nadav and, uh -huh. and uh, this n equals four, um, are n equals four three dimensional theories. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Correct. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Gabriel. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, um, any other comments, questions, concerns? So I don't see any anything else. Um, so if not, let's thank Gabriel again, and then we resume for now, and then go, come back.